Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, for the kind words and for inviting me. This is not only a cinema hall, it is also a former concert hall. And there have been many rock concerts here. And I'm from this city, but I live in Oslo now. So I know that the first performer on any concert is just a warm up. Uh, so I'm going to warm up on the team uh, and uh, leave the more interesting things to the, to the other one. You have seen that I have a jacket, after all, so I can take it off, I, okay? It is... Um... So, um, my team is going to be a little bit... Uh, a little bit critical of my own profession, in the sense that if you're going to deal with both development and uh, uh, inequality, I think it is important to don't believe so much in the exaggerations in the textbook uh, of economics. Uh, I think textbooks are not very representative for the discipline as a whole, but I think very often that uh, uh, we are always sort of colored by the images that we get, uh, that are given in the textbooks, whether we have studied economics or not. I think this, this is actually true. So I think the, the, the first thing uh, to, to notice uh, when we sort of approach uh, inequality and what I call the crisis of inequality in the world is that you have to, you have to for, forget about the very flexibility that are performed in, uh, in, uh, in the presentation of, of economics in textbooks in the, in the sense that I sort of, the supply side is very malleable. You can sort of do all the changes you like in short uh, horizon. Competition is basically about prices and, and, and costs. Uh, this is a picture that uh, I think nobody would re immediately recognize as, as the best uh, abstraction from whatever country you approach. I think first of all, the, the most uh, important thing in, uh, in economics that is that competition is basically over new things. New technologies, new uh, products, new way of organization. That's the basic, that's the essence of competition in, uh, in any capitalist society, rich or poor. Uh, so when there is a crisis of inequality, I would sort of associate that with that, that this speed of creative destruction is slowed down. And I consider inequality as a poverty trap. It, it, it is a poverty trap because there is a lot of reinforcing mechanism, including technological change that uh, uh, I mentioned uh, a bit about. Uh, it, it also, according to sort of the process of creative destruction, the, the development of new things in any country, that you easily get stuck with, uh, in that process if you have a high enough inequality. And they, that will be part of the things I'm going to emphasize. There's also political reinforcement mechanism that once you have inequality, these uh, divisions, uh, cleavages in society, they are sort of reinforced in policies that maintain them and give power to people and uh, influence of groups that easily maintain these policies. And that's, this is what I would call the crisis of, of inequality. It is a crisis that is it, it's not uh, uh, abrupt in the sense that uh, things are happening uh, had to be resolved immediately. It's more like a permanent crisis. It sneaks in. Very, uh, so it, 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 it colors everything that the uh, country does. Uh, and uh, therefore, it is uh, important, but it doesn't get the, the big uh, uh, headlines in, in, in the media. Very often, it is the case that where inequality is large enough, then it's little noticed. Because changes are little noticed when there are huge differences already. But in countries where there are small differences, say countries in Northern Europe, Sweden, um, then when there is a change in inequality, it increases, it's noticed immediately. And these reactions are themselves a sort of stabilizing effect. You can have increasing inequality in countries with huge inequality initially, and there's no social reaction. There's no news in a newspaper. But in Sweden, and maybe even in Norway, 
these are on the headlines, even though the level of inequality is low compared to other countries, and the, sort of the, the, the level of child poverty, for example, is low by most measures uh, compared to other countries. Nevertheless, these things are on the headlines. And that this interaction between social reactions and reality, I think, is important. Let me start a little bit by uh, noticing something. Um, if you take the, the, the lowest technology in use in the US and the most efficient technology in use in the US, and you move, say, from the 10% lowest technology to the 90% most efficient technology, this is a jump in 330%. That means that the, the gap between the most efficient and the least efficient technology in use measured by the productivity is uh, uh, a jump of 330%. If you do the same exercise in India, it is uh, like 2,260%. There's a huge gap between the least productive uh, technology in use and the most productive technology use. And most countries, including India, use the most efficient uh, technology, but they use it to a much lower extent than, say, the US. So th this, this development gap, I call it, between the most efficient and the least efficient technology in use is tremendously large across countries. It varies, and it's a very interesting statistic. It's not available, you can't read about it in... in uh, in the official statistics, you have to do rather brave assumptions in order to calculate these things by the, the numbers that are available. But, but trust me, we, we have done as well as we can, and, and others have done similar, similar things and get similar results. If you do the gap in, in China, just to have a comparison, that's a little bit uh, less of a jump. And the reason of, than, uh, than India, and the reason is that China is a little bit more developed than, than, than India. So these gaps between the most efficient and the least efficient technology in use, they shrink as, as countries develop. But this is, um, I will mention some other countries later on, but it's important to understand that when you have a huge gap and technology between the most efficient and least efficient, and when technologies can't be malleable after they sort of have been invested, you can't, you can't make a rickshaw into a, into a truck. You, you can't do that. It has to take time. You have to build a truck in, in order to replace a rickshaw by a truck. If you have these huge gaps, you can't equalize income across occupation, across sectors, across enterprises, as long as they have very different uh, technologies. So this means that the, 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 the existence of these huge gaps make e equality very different to achieve. Simply because there are some people, they, they can earn a lot in good jobs, and there are other people, the great majority, they earn very little in bad jobs. And so that means that you, if you're going to have if you're going to have equality, and I think equality can be a development strategy, but if you're going to have equality in, in developing countries, you have to have structural change. You have to, have to, you have to change these technologies, because there's no way, if you, if you equalize in, uh, earnings, labor earnings, for example, in a country like India, to the average earnings in the country, you make a lot of people unemployed, much more than there are already. So, uh, so this is a starting point. But any, if for any country, the existing wage structure, that you have huge inequality that is associated with the gaps in, in, uh, uh, between the most efficient, least efficient technology, that also have implications for how people invest in new technologies. Why is that? Well, I said that this is the most important competition. It's not cost and prices. This is what, what you innovate, the new things that you introduce. Well, you introduce some things in, in an economy with huge differences. That means that you can foresee that when you use this technology in the future, you can gradually man it by, by people who don't have to pay so much. Uh, but in the beginning, maybe, you have to have very qualified people, and they are relatively very expensive because of the huge inequalities in, in society. So that means that it is the huge inequality in these countries in earnings 
hamper technological change that is necessary in order to introduce uh, more equality. And of course, also necessary if you want to develop and increase the average income. Let's now see, look at uh, Northern Europe. Northern European countries have smaller earnings differentials. They are also smaller countries and less problems. So we shouldn't be so brave or we shouldn't be bragging so much about it. But if you move now from the least efficient technology in use and to the most efficient use using the same similar measure, it's a much less of a, of a, of a jump. It is a jump in 120%. That means that, uh, that the least efficient technology in use is, is, is say, 80% of the productivity of the most efficient technology in use. Of course, then you can equalize wages uh, because you can, without creating unemployment, because you know you have the gap in technology is, is not uh, um, that uh, counterproductive for doing things like that. So you can do this even without creating much uh, unemployment. And it's also the case that, that you have, that the wages when you invest, they are not so much tied to the productivity of the most efficient unit that you are willing to invest in. That means that when you invest, you are not so much thinking about that this is going to be excessive cost because you have the most modern technology that is in use. So these countries modernize much more. And as a result, they have much smaller wage uh, gaps, much less uh, earnings inequality. Uh, because it's profitable to modernize. And of course, when you modernize, there's a huge demand for, for labor, and then you can raise the lowest wages without creating unemployment. And that's what's happening in, in Northern Europe, uh, if you are viewing broadly on it, uh, including countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, uh, for sure the Scandinavian countries, to some extent uh, Germany, for a long time that they sort of have compressed, it's sometimes called, compressed the wage differentials, which make creative destruction faster. It speeds it up. It speeds it up because it, it's, it's more profitable to invest in modern things because the, 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 the pay to those who work there are not tied to the high productivity of the most modern enterprises. So this is, so what I'm, the reason why I'm saying all this is that many people think that we are, we are, we are redistributing income, and that's it in, in the countries. And, and this is what, uh, if they're going to imitate or be inspired by European countries, this is what developing countries should do. But, but notice that the basic adjustment here is not the redistribution of income. It is to lay the foundation for small productivity gaps. This is the basic message. So it is the adjustment to equality itself that sustains equality. But the other, on the other hand, it is the adjustment to inequality that sustains inequality. So it's not the inequality in itself that is uh, the problem. It is the problem, and it is what economists normally say is an equilibrium. And this is a bad equilibrium. It reinforces technological choices that... Uh, uh, sustain the, the high inequality in society. So this is the first mechanism that I say, if you were able to, by some mechanism, say subsidize schooling, or uh, other kinds of skill formation, that you, can, that you can lay the foundation for smaller earnings differentials, or maybe you can have organizations that help in this, you would achieve uh, good things. And a lot of experiences from that, in, uh, in particular in Northern European countries, but also you can find it somewhere in developing countries. When South Korea developed, they did something like that, that they compressed somewhat the wage differences. There was not under democratic rules so much, uh, so maybe we dislike it for other reasons. But, but economically, this was what's happening. They compressed the wage differences. What did then happen? Well, they modernized the economy, so even though you kept the highest wage is a little bit lower, you developed, so the average productivity went up, and the average pay went up. And you moved people from low productivity jobs to high productivity jobs. It's not, uh, it is a simple story, but it, sometimes it needs to be told, I think, because this focus on flexibility on production side and, and considering equality just as a cost, miss this point. Miss this very simple point that when you compress, make people more 
equal each other, then you lay the foundation for uh, an economy that accounts for people that people are really similar. So this is my first point. My second point is how does this spill over to policies and politics? Well, the first we should notice is that the, the, in, in the basic principle of, of reinforcement in, in, uh, in politics is that those who have the goal get the rule, and those who get the rule get the goal. So this is, an, again, an equilibrium, but maybe in a different way that is normally said, that it is that when people when you have inequality, in the economy, then you get the politics that sort of reflect the power associated with inequality. And it's very difficult to, to, uh, to come around this basic uh, principle. I mean, just mention here, not the, not the most important thing, but something that I think is, is well worth noticing, and this is how it... <laughs> spills over in social policy and, and well, sort of things that we call in this part of the world welfare state policies, but uh, that will be more social policies uh, uh, generally formulated in, in, in other countries. First of all, social policies in, in many countries, economists have got an obsession that the, the most basic thing with social policies is that they cost something. And they, they get all the... Uh, they put all the light on the cost side. Well, it's, uh, it's important to, to see the cost, but it, it is even more important to see the benefits. And the benefits are less visible. They are almost like sort of away from the picture. It's, if, if there is some of the, about the benefits, it's, it's some misuse of arrangement. And all. But if you, if you really think about it, these policies are maybe the most important for sort of extend the capabilities of people, increase security, prevent local, individual, household poverty traps caused by normal circumstances in any economy that they shouldn't have long-lasting consequences that will hamper the economy. It will also make people stronger in uh, the single models with, uh, with, uh, with uh, some sort of social security or, or some sort of social insurance can speak up their mind against uh, brute exploitation or whatever it is. If she doesn't have it, she, she, can't, aff she can't afford to, to raise her voice. And we've seen this. Let me just take a little digression. We have a big uh, research project together with an Indian uh, woman called uh, Shabana Mitra about uh, the cycle program in the state of Bihar in, uh, in, uh, in um, India. The cycle program was introduced in 2006. It, the cycle program consists of uh, giving bicycles to all girls that say they're going to continue school when they are 13 years old. A small program, many people will say. I say not. A big program. First of all, it's universal. It goes to everybody. It's not means tested. Upper and lower caste both, both get it. It empowers girls. It empowers girls. First of all, it reduces the transport cost to go to school. That was the, and it, that was the basic uh, motivation for it. But it also has other social consequences that these girls become much more independent. We, we measure how much they can move away from the home without the support of brothers or without the support or maybe even without the allowance of the father. And this is a tremendous change. We compare them with other girls that were just too old. Uh, uh, to get the bikes uh, when it was introduced. And we compared them to girls in the neighboring uh, states, Uttar Pradesh and Yakartan, uh, and, and we can identify the, the differences. And the, the changes are tremendous. So they, they uh, become more empowered, they become more independent, they marry later, they complete school. The increase in schooling is 30%, in the, particularly in the beginning. But what we also then... Uh, identify is that after a while, they stumble on some other hindrance, namely, are there jobs for them outside agriculture? And very often it isn't. So this is, this is the old discussion that some of you would know quite well, that Albert Hirschman 
raised, that, the, that is balanced growth good, or is balanced growth necessary for development? And here it is quite clear that you, you come a long way by introducing these reforms, but then you stumble on, on, on the nest obstacles. But maybe then you get social reactions of these girls. No, they can, they can read and write. They can even bike to a political meeting. Remember that bikes were very important for, for, for the propag propagation for women's voting rights everywhere, including in this country. In the US, it was very important. There are those who agitated for, for female voting rights, extending the franchise. They came on bikes, and bikes were not socially acceptable for, for women at that time. The same in Norway. They were running around on bikes. Okay, digression ended. So, <coughs> but the reason why I mention it is that these are productivity gains. These, these young women, these young women, they are empowered in more than one sense, they become more capable, more productive, and more independent. And, and to talk about this only from the cost side, it's, it, um, I get irritated when I, I see people who do that. It's, I'm not saying that I'm the only one who knows about the gains, or that we here are the only, no, are the only one who knows about the gains. But there's some misplaced emphasis. That's, what, that's my basic point here. So what is it then, if you study countries that have various degrees of social policies that benefits the majority in the country, what are the effects of inequality in this? Well, if you go to the classical political scientists and even economists, many people thought that huge inequalities should mobilize voters in favor of very progressive social policies because there were a majority that earned less than the average income. That is true for every country. In some countries, it's 80% that's below the average. So, it, because there's some super rich that drag up the average and there are many poor that keep, uh, uh, that keep the median uh, income level very low. In, in India, the median income level is almost equal to the poverty rate. Right. Sorry, poverty line. I say it again, the median income in India is equal to the poverty line, almost. Um, so, so what does this mean? Well, it, it isn't true in any country. I have seen it in any country. I really try to investigate these things. It isn't the case. What is the case then? The case is that the public programs of social policies, they are not redistributive in the first sense. They are providers of services for poor people, maybe, for the majority of the population. Schooling, health program. I think Rohini later today will talk about, uh, uh, maybe, at least mention, the food programs. India has most of the, the most generous uh, and biggest uh, uh, school feeding program in the world. It's very little mentioned often. But they, they go to things like that. And these things, they are normal good. They are normal goods in the sense when people get richer, they would like to have more of them. And then they will mobilize in order to get them. Very few places you see policies that are taken from the rich and giving it to the poor. It's on the other way, you want to expand the scale of certain things that are normal goods. When you get richer, you would like to have more, even though you have to pay some taxes for to, to get them. And that means when you, when you make differentials smaller by some of the things that they say are speeding up the creative destruction, then you also you increase the average income, which is very good for any policy, and you also make differentials smaller. That means that the majority becomes more rich than the others if you succeed in doing this. And that means that they will demand politically Parties that can offer these things will get more support uh, for the provisions of uh, uh, healthcare uh, and, and social insurance uh, and whatever school feeding programs uh, you would like to have, guaranteed employment uh, to, to weak groups and things like that. And so, so this is the re political reinforcement. And it is in a minor area. I just mentioned social policies because it fits to the picture that we are we're having. It. Of course, in the big, big policies that you see, in other ways, maybe this enforcement is even stronger, where you have that, that rich people have much more of an influence on the, 
on the real decisions and make very stupid decisions, maybe. Uh, but here I just mentioned social insurance type of, uh, uh, of, of goods that you think we sort of be associated with, with the reverse, namely big inequalities should generate support for redistribution. That's all. These policies are redistributive, but the first thing is that they provide something that the market doesn't provide automatically. They are redistributive in the sense that they are offered on better terms for the poor than for the rich. And the poor can benefit more from it than the rich can do. And so in that sense it's redistributive, but it has this aspect that it is provision of something. And I think this is important uh, to under understand that, 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 that it doesn't have so much of a legitimacy very often to take from the rich. I hope Bertil will come back on this, to take from the rich and give to the poor. It, it, is, it is when you finance something that is needed in the population that you can mobilize people, maybe out of self-interest uh, and some kind of group identification. So let me sum up, now I'm finished. So let me, so there are economic reinforcement mechanisms and there are political reinforcement mechanisms. Together, in countries with huge inequalities, they make for very little social policies, the, uh, the uh, staggering growth, persistence of, of poverty levels, and persistence of inequality in itself. It also makes that, that you don't have a takeoff because it, it isn't profitable. You got the Industrial Revolution in England not because wages were low. It was because they had the highest wages in the world. That's why, why you got the Industrial Revolution. Because then it took off with the machinery and uh, things that you have to replace these, these workers. And if they were not replaced, at least if you waited a little bit, then it was uh, absorbed into the labor force. So I stop by, by saying this, that the, I think the crisis of inequality is not always well understood, but I think there are bits and pieces that need to be uh, merged together. The crisis in itself is that we live in a world that's unnecessary, unequal, unnecessary, poor. It could be improved much by simple means. Thank you.